In this video, we'll talk about Streptococcus pneumoniae. If you're going in order and following my microbiology series the way that I had intended, this should be the first video where you're listening about a streptococcal species. Now recall from the previous video that we made it down the flow diagram and we talked about gram-positive organisms, and then those gram-positive organisms were separated into three broad categories. You see cocci shown here on the left. Those are our spherical uh, type of bacterial pathogens. And I've blacked out the two other larger umbrella terms that describe the shape of the pathogen because we're just not there yet in this series. I then told you that within the cocci category, you can either have catalase positive cocci, which puts you in the direction of all of your different staphylococci, or you can have catalase negative cocci, and that's where we'll pick up today. So I want you to imagine that, that we're zooming in on this section, which you see here with that fuzzy orange line. We're talking about gram-positive cocci, but specifically we're talking about catalase-negative gram-positive cocci. And that pushes us in the direction of talking about all the different strep organisms. So if you follow that orange fuzzy line, you now know we're talking about gram-positive cocci that are catalase-negative. And therefore, we're only talking about the different types of streptococcal organisms. And I want you to imagine that we zoom in on that catalase negative streptococci branch. In order to further subdivide what species of streptococcal organism we're talking about, we can further subdivide this into three different categories. And the first division will be based on the type of hemolysis that these streptococcal organisms have. So test writers can refer to one of three different types of hemolysis. You can see things that are alpha hemolytic, you can see pathogens that are beta hemolytic, or you can see pathogens that are gamma hemolytic. And you may see gamma hemolytic written as no hemolysis. Those terms are used interchangeably. Alpha hemolysis refers to the partial breakdown of hemoglobin on the blood agar. Beta hemolysis refers to complete breakdown of hemoglobin on the blood agar. And then gamma hemolysis, like I said before, there's no breakdown whatsoever. And looking at these images, you can probably appreciate on the plate the extent to which that breakdown occurs. So beta, you see a lot of it, alpha, you see partial, and gamma, you see pretty much nothing at all. And so when we talk about streptococcal organisms, when you're trying to figure out what type of strep you're talking about, the overall category is gram-positive cocci that are catalase negative, and then the test writer will tell you it's alpha hemolytic, it's beta hemolytic, or it's gamma hemolytic. And then depending on what they tell you, that kind of pushes you in the direction of one of two different types of bacteria in each of those hemolysis categories. So if you're dealing with gram-positive catalase negative strep that is alpha hemolytic, it can be either strep pneumoniae, which this video is on, or viridens strep. If we're talking about gram-positive streptococci that are catalase negative and that are beta hemolytic, you can be talking about either strep pyogenes or strep agalactiae. And lastly, if you're talking about gram-positive cocci, streptococci that are catalase negative and gamma hemolytic, meaning there's no hemolysis, you're talking either about enterococcus or strep bovis. Now within each of these three different hemo uh, hemolytic categories, there are other ways to further subdivide it. So we can go further down this chain, this branch, to figure out are we dealing with strep pneumoniae or are we de dealing with viridens strep. And the same thing for the beta hemolysis category and the gamma hemolysis category. More on that when we get to those videos on, for example, strep pyogenes and strep agalactiae. But since this video is on strep pneumoniae, we'll focus on this alpha hemolytic category. Now, of course, when it comes to differentiating strep pneumoniae versus viridens strep, you could figure that out based on either the virulence factors, if the test writer gives you buzzwords, you could figure that out based on the clinical picture. So what kind of clinical problem are we dealing with? Are we dealing with something like pneumonia or meningitis? Or are we dealing with something else that might push us in the direction of viridens strep? But if you're given no buzzwords and you're given no clinical information whatsoever, the way to further subdivide the alpha hemolysis category is to figure out is the pathogen in question optotion sensitive, shown on the left, or optotion resistant, shown on the right. And if it's optotion sensitive, we're dealing with strep pneumoniae. If it's optotion resistant, we're dealing with viridens strep. So just to really hammer this home, we are talking about gram-positive cocci that are catalase negative. 
Therefore, we're talking about strep. We are talking about alpha hemolytic strep, which tells us it's either strep pneumoniae or viridin strep. And then depending on how it responds to optotion, if it's sensitive to optotion, it's pneumonia. And if it's resistant to optotion, it is viridins. And that's how you go down this branch, down this tree, to figure out what kind of bacterial pathogen are you dealing with if the test writer is going to be a complete jerk and not give you any buzzwords whatsoever. Now, I want you to have an easy way to memorize this. So when I look at pneumonia, there's an O in it. When I look at viridins, there's an R in it. So the O in pneumonia reminds me optotion sensitive. The R in viridins reminds me of resistant. So R in viridins for optotion resistant, O in pneumonia for optotion sensitive. All right, that sort of works. It's just a way to help you work through this tree. Now, Today's video is obviously about strep pneumonia, so let's talk about this pathogen in particular. As you've seen already, it is a gram-positive cocci that is catalase negative, it's alpha hemolytic, and it's optotion sensitive. And of course, as we just talked about on the last slide, that optotion piece differentiates strep pneumonia from strep viridins in the absence of any other buzzwords or clinical information. The really high yield thing to know about strep pneumonia is that it's encapsulated, and we'll talk about that more in just a few slides, but that capsule is made of polysaccharides and confers the ability of strep pneumonia to be highly virulent. Shape-wise, strep pneumonia are described to be lancet-shaped diplococci that can occur in chains, and that whole phrase is a buzzword that's super, super high yield. Okay, what that looks like is this. So diplococci means two coccuses or cocci that occur together. So you see this pairing diplococci, two cocci, and they occur in these little groups and they can either occur in chains or they can occur kind of spaced out a bit as you see here. So this is the image you'll probably see on your exam. These are diplococci and that's very, very high yield. Other things to know about strep pneumonia, they're bile soluble, they are facultative anaerobes and this bacterial pathogen is typically found in the nasopharynx. Highest yield part of our conversation so far is knowing the flow through that branching diagram, knowing about optotion, knowing this is the lancet-shaped diplococci, and knowing that this is the slide you'll see if the test writer wants to give you a histological image. Now let's talk about the virulence factors, and strep pneumonia's virulence factors are, are, are very high yield because they're very unique. The first thing, which I've already alluded to, is that strep pneumonia is encapsulated. So there is a polysaccharide capsule that prevents this pathogen against phagocytosis. And that's really important for this bacteria to cause infections. Because of the fact that strep pneumonia has this very dense polysaccharide capsule, it is known to cause OPSI, O-P-S-I. And that stands for overwhelming post splenectomy infection. Now, OPSI occurs in individuals who are asplenic, and I want to just take a moment to explain this to you like you're a fifth grader, because I see this come up on exams and question banks all the time. This is without question the most important thing to know about strep pneumonia. So somebody who has a normal spleen can carry out normal complement. And don't freak out, but if you think back to your immunology lectures, you were supposed to learn that a key part of complement is what's known as opsonization. And opsonization is when the foreign material gets tagged with C3B. And C3B is kind of like sticking a flag post in the pathogen and signaling to the immune system and these very specialized macrophages that exist inside the spleen, hey, that thing is not supposed to be here. See that C3B sticking out of it on its head? that C3B flag is telling you, get this thing out of here. So opsonization is a key part of complement where the immune system tags something with C3B and then specialized macrophages inside of the spleen see the C3B and phagocytize and remove it from the spleen. So the spleen serves a very specialized function that relies on opsonization in order to get bacterial pathogens out. 
Now, the thing about bacterial pathogens that have capsules and that, like strep pneumonia, are encapsulated in that thick polysaccharide capsule is that it relies on opsonization in order to get it out. Because that bacteria has that capsule, the body has to very delicately opsonize it. So it has to place that C3B in the right location on the capsule. Otherwise, it's really difficult for the body to get it out because the capsule is protecting it from other immune processes. So as you might imagine, if we have somebody who has a splenia or is a splenic, then you knock out their spleen. They lose the ability to use opsonization and therefore they can't tag things in the right locations with C3B. And therefore those specialized macrophages that carry out phagocytosis after seeing the opsonization and after seeing the C3B that never takes place. And so somebody who is a splenic can be a splenic due to either what's known as anatomic asplenia or functional asplenia. And again, I'm just over explaining this because I think this is really important to understand. Anatomic asplenia is when you lose your spleen because it's been surgically or physically removed or altered. So let's say that somebody is involved in a car accident. Something that's really high yield to know is that if people are involved in a motor vehicle collision, the steering wheel pressing against their kind of mid to upper abdomen can cause a splenic rupture, which might require surgery to remove it. So first bit of high yield information here in my little high yield aside is knowing that in a motor vehicle collision, if that steering wheel bumps into your mid to upper abdomen, one of the common injuries we see is injuries to the spleen. And so surgically, if the spleen gets removed, you are anatomically a splenic. You don't have the spleen. Therefore, the body cannot opsonize these capsulated organisms like strep pneumonia. Functional asplenia is the spleen is still in the body, but it doesn't work. So functionally, it's not there. And we see this classically with patients with sickle cell. So in sickle cell, if there's an occlusive crisis in the spleen and you lose the ability to use that splenic tissue like you otherwise normally should, then functionally, although the spleen is still in the body, it's just not working. So in any of these cases, anything that affects the spleen can affect the, the body's ability to carry out opsonization. Therefore, complement can occur correctly because C3B can't be tagged on the encapsulated organism. The organism cannot be phagocytosed by the specialized macrophages. And obviously, you get infections. So if you're taking USMLE, Comlex, or whatever other in-class exam you're on, and you have a patient that is concerning for some type of anatomic or functional asplenia, and then all of a sudden, they develop symptoms like fever, fatigue, malaise, sepsis, or they die, you want to start to think of encapsulated organisms. So that was a big aside. I know that I over-explained that, but it's a very high-yield concept to understand. Strep pneumoniae's capsule is highly virulent. So this causes infections in patients who have problems with their spleen. Now, the other virulence factor that we need to talk about is what's known as IgA protease. IgA protease, as the name implies, cleaves mucosal IgA. And recall that in the mucosal areas of the body, IgA is located there to help fend off infections. And so it shouldn't be surprising to you to hear that strep pneumonia can cause MOPS, M-O-P-S, meningitis, otitis media, particularly in children, pneumonia, and sinusitis. And if you look and think about it, what do all of these infections have in common? Well, they're all the result of potential mucosal infections. So the sinuses, the lungs, the ears, and the brain. These all have mucosal interfaces. And so the fact that strep pneumonia has an IgA protease makes it highly virulent and highly likely to infect through these routes of entry because it's cleaving mucosal IgA. Now, all of this stuff is really important to memorize, and I have an awesome mnemonic. Instead of saying strep pneumonia, I want you to think strep pneumopsia. And the pneumopsia, M-O-P-S-I, tells you two things. One, it has opsy in the name, so it reminds you of overwhelming post-splenectomy infection. And it has mops in the name, so it reminds you of meningitis, otitis media, pneumonia, and sinusitis. Last thing I want to throw in here, because it is a buzzword that shows up on exams pretty often, is if they give you rust-colored sputum, you want to think strep pneumonia. For some reason, the pneumonia that strep pneumonia causes is classically associated with this rust-colored sputum. Brief aside on treatment, as you've seen already in these microbiology videos, I don't spend a lot of time on treatment because I don't think it's as important to know as all the buzzwords and pathophysiology, but treatment-wise, the textbook answer is penicillin, macrolides, or a third-generation cephalosporin. 
Here's your summary slide. So again, appearance, lancet-shaped diplococci. It can occur in chains. Characteristics, we beat this to death. Gram-positive, catalase-negative, alpha-hemolytic, optotion-sensitive. Remember, strep pneumonia has the O in the name. Tells you that's optotion-sensitive. Compare that against strep viridens. The viridens strep have an R in the name that tells you R for resistant, optotion-resistant. Virulence factors, the polysaccharide capsule, so it's a problem for patients who are asplenic, and the IgA protease, so it infects those mucosal surfaces and causes MOPs. Remember, strep pneumopsiae for MOPs and OPSI. Treatment, penicillin, third-generation cephalosporin, and a macrolide. So that is everything that you need to know for strep pneumoniae.